Hi, David. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, can you start by uh, introducing yourself and tell us uh, how you came across uh, Teen Angels Work? Hi, yeah, my name is David DeBaca. Um, we're, we're here about Teen Angel, and uh, I'm 51 years old. And uh, my first introduction to Teen Angel was when I was 12 years old. I come from San Diego, and I grew up in a, in a Chicano neighborhood in, down in San Diego. And so I was heavily influenced by the lowrider and Chicano culture. And so at that time, um, there wasn't any uh, pub, you know, published work about lowriders or Chicano culture. So when Lowrider Magazine hit, hit the streets when I was 12 years old, it was a big deal for me because I was passionate about lowriding, I was passionate about the Chicano culture. And so when the magazine hit the streets, I was pumped up because here I was, this little kid, I'd been into low riding and, and the Chicano culture since I was about eight or nine years old. And now to have this magazine dedicated to low riding and the Chicano culture was a big deal to me. In addition to being into low riding, I was into art. I drew all the time. My parents always influenced me and my brothers to, to be artists and to express yourselves through art. So it was a big part of my life. So when I first picked up a lowrider magazine, not only was there lowriders in there, but there was an artist drawing lowriders and drawing the lifestyle. His name was Teenage. And uh, seeing his artwork was really inspirational for me. So from the first issue I got, I started, started subscribing. And so every month I would wait to see what was next, what was Teenage going to draw next, what lowriders were going to be featured next. And it was a big deal, man. It was, had a lot of impact on me. And since that was the only publication at the time focusing on that lifestyle, that was all I had for 30 days. So I was so into it, I would read that magazine from front to back cover, and I would I memorize those magazines. So by the time you know I was 12, 13, 14, I knew those magazines like the back of my hand because that was all I had. That was my only fix. There was no uh, computers. There was no phones. I had no no other access to it. So that was like my feed. My dope feed, you know. And uh, about 1981, Teen Angels started his own magazine. He was still working for Lowrider Magazine, but his magazine was a little bit more focused on the people behind the culture of Lowrider, the Chicanos in the neighborhood. It wasn't just focusing about the, the lifestyle of the Lowrider cars, although that was a part of Teen Angels, but it focused on the neighborhoods, on the bodies, on the people from the neighborhood the way they dress, the way the neighborhoods look. And to, you know, mainstream America, when they saw his his magazine, it was, a, it was, they felt it was almost like a threatening magazine because you opened the book and it had a lot of, a lot of gang culture in it. It had a lot of gang influence. It had a lot of graffiti, photos of graffiti. Um, photos of the, the guys and the girls from the neighborhood and that was a threatening thing to people. So people didn't want to see that and people didn't want to glorify that. But Teen Angel saw the beauty in that lifestyle. So when about 82, 83 when he left Royal Magazine, he was able to do what he was passionate about and do something for the people that he felt had no voice. You know what I mean? The cholos and the cholas on the street, if you were 14, 15, 16, 17 year old kid, and you were from, uh, you know, your family didn't have a lot of money, you had no way to get out of that neighborhood. And so you didn't know what was happening in the other bodies. You just knew what was influenced to you from your own hood. So when you got teenagers magazine, you were able to see what was happening in other neighborhoods, you know, throughout in California, throughout the Southwest, California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Colorado. And so it was a real, informative and it was like a, a, a connection piece for the people from these neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. you know, so if, if you were living in a little neighborhood in Imperial Valley, you might not have ever left that valley. But when you bought Teen Angels magazine, you were able to see what was happening in you know in, in different areas in Bakersfield, in Arizona, in Texas. And likewise they would see what's happening here. So you know you would see the, the style of graffiti on the walls, the, the way the dudes dress. And you know, as threatening as you know, mainstream America thought it was, teenagers saw beauty. So it's like, man, when I see a dude with his hair slicked back and he's all dialed in, 
or a chick with you know, nice hair and some chola pants, <laughs> dressed real sharp. He saw beauty in it, where other people were threatened. He needed to saw the beauty of it. And, and also at that time, if you dress that way, because a lot of people dress that way now, and it's kind of more of a fashion statement. Mm -hmm. But it, at that time, if you dress that way, uh, it was almost like a target was on. Mm -hmm. Because if I was a homeboy coming out wearing a panel team and shades and khakis, I was letting everybody know, hey, I'm from the body. Mm -hmm. and so you had to be careful because there were dudes from other neighborhoods, and if they're seeing you like that, it was a challenging thing. They want to know who you are and if you're in their neighborhood, what you're doing. So it's not like anybody could dress that way because you had to be able to back up the way you look. So, go ahead. Uh, so, Teen Angel was always a, an anonymous artist. Can you tell yeah, us so the story is, of uh, how you discovered who yeah, he was? Yeah, what it is with myself, I was influenced by Teen Angel and I thought Teen Angel was more of like a... Uh, in my mind, I picture this hardcore cholo dude. Because you look at the magazine, you look at the, the artwork, and you see all these dudes in prison all tatted up. So in my mind, I had a picture of this cool guy. He would write stories. Uh, and he was also a lowrider, a Chicano historian, because he would, um, he would write stories about the history of games, the history of lowriding, the history of the Chicano culture. So he was a historian, in a sense into something that mattered to him but didn't matter to the normal historian. They didn't, need to, they didn't want to know about why gang bangers fought other neighborhoods or why dudes were making their cars low. Nobody had an interest in it. But Teen Angel did and he documented it. So it was a big thing for me. And I would read his stories for a, a you know, 12, 13, 14 year old boy to be reading these stories and to see where this all came from. It was interesting to me because I never saw it like that. So as I grew older, I always had this interest in it. And as the 80s went on into the 90s, the magazine continued on. But nobody ever knew who Teen Angel was. It was never, his name was never published anywhere in the magazine. And around the early 2000s, I started curating exhibits, Chicano and lowrider influence exhibits. And I always had an interest in Teen Angel because he had such a big influence in my life. I considered him like the godfather of lowrider and Chicano art because, you know, when it came to pub published material, because like for the Hot Rodders, they had Ed Rock, and he, his art would come out in the magazine. And for the uh, bikers, they had David Mann. And the lowriders, we had Teen Angel. And he was the one who, everybody became familiar with in the magazine. So, when I started curating exhibits, I always had this interest in finding this old Pachuca teen angel. But I hit dead ends everywhere I asked about him. And it was like all these urban legends. Some people said he lived in San Jose. Some people said he had moved to Mexico. Others told me he was locked up. So I never knew what it was. You know, I, I, I came to realize that I wasn't going to gonna find this dude. And so with me, the way it came to me is I was, I'm, I'm not into just Chicano Royal art, I'm into art in general because I appreciate it. And I was at this uh, train exhibit, uh, not a train exhibit, but like Americana type train art. And I was walking by a vendor's table and there was some, some train art laid out. And I stopped in my tracks because what I was looking at was Teen Angel art, but it wasn't, it, it, it didn't have that Chicano flair to it or the gangster flair. It was Americana art. It was trains and, and uh, you know, American flags and, and small some people. But the style was Chicago, was Teen Angel. And so I, I picked up that piece of art in one of these prints. And right away I looked at the guy selling it and I said, you know, if, if it didn't have a white guy's name here, I would swear this is Teen Angel art. And in my mind, I was like, this has to be Teen And the guy said, yeah, that's Teen Angel. That's, that's my stepdad. I said, wait a minute, there's a white guy's name. And he goes, Teen Angel's mine. I said, so it was like this, you know, eye-opening experience to me. And I was like, Teen Angel's mine. I was like confused, you know what I mean? Because the Teen Angel I knew wasn't mine. He was a Chicano. And he was like an essay, a trolo, a chupo, a baco. And I was like, yeah, let's see, right? So 
the guy was amazed because I started telling him all these stories about all the art because I had memorized it all in my mind. And I went on and on to talk about you know, all these memories I had of Canadian. And the guy was pretty amazed and he said, you know what, I'm going to give you his phone number and his address. He said, uh, write him a letter or give him a call. And he'll be too proud to hear from you. So about a week later, I called him. And, and uh, to, to say the least, he wasn't very happy that his stepson had gave me his phone number or his address. And so I wasn't uh, accepted by him initially. And he made it clear not to call him anymore. I just told him that he had a huge influence on my life and I told him how I curated exhibits and I was you know, always interested in doing something on him. And he, had, he had no interest in that. He told me just to lose his number basically and not call him again and lose his address. And one statement he said before we hung up, he says, you know, I haven't left my home in years. And he said, I won't even step outside. And he said, I wish I did, he said, because I would like to buy a 37 Chevy model to build. He built model cars like you want to see here. And, they, and he said, uh, but I won't even go outside to do that. He goes, that's how much I don't want to deal with people. So I said, I respect that. We hung up. For me, I'm a model car collector as well. And I build model cars too. So the first thing I did, I went into my garage and I have a collection of model cars. And I pulled out one of these boxes of a 37 Chevy model. I put it in a box and I wrote a heartfelt letter. And I just said, I respect your privacy. I'll never call you or, or mail you again. But you said, he wanted a 37 Chevy convertible. And this is just a token of, a small token of appreciation for the impact you had on my life and the impact you had on the life of the low rider culture. And I sent it off and I never expected to hear from him again. And uh, now a week later I received a package, a postal package at my door. I came home from work and there was this package and uh, inside was an original drawing and some magazines and he said, uh, you know, I was so touched by your letter, you can call me whenever you want. And that started the relationship with him, between him and I. We talked for probably close to a, a year on the phone before I ever met him in person. He was very uh, apprehensive about allowing anybody in his life. And uh, after about a year, he invited me to his home and, and it was a big deal. It was just. At that time, his, his only real contact to the outside world was his wife. And then when I started came into his life, you know, I became a part of his life. And, and when we became best friends, genuinely best friends. And it was it was probably another year before he ever showed me any artwork. We were just genuine friends, and, and I would go up, you know, once or twice a month and visit, and we would just spend the day talking about his art and. Uh, he wasn't just into the lowrider and Chicano scene. He was into ci the Civil War. He was into the uh, military art. So we talked about all types of uh, his historical issues and that kind of thing. I would, I would, he never had a computer. So he didn't have a cell phone. He had no contact with the outside world. And so I would bring my laptop and I would show him things. And he was amazed at how many people were still into his magazine and that type of thing. And I would bring books on the Civil War to his house and we'd study them. And, and it, it just became a genuine friendship in that time. So the magazine, it was uh, more or less for him a way to communicate with uh, people? Teen Angels? Yeah. Yeah, it was, Teen Angels magazine was, uh, it was an outlet for the youth from the bottom. And there was dedications. So, you know, when a girl sent in a dedication to Teen Angel Magazine, she was making a statement. Hey, I want to tell my boyfriend Smiley that I love him and I want to dedicate this song to him you know, from his high night like giggles. And you were putting it out there. She said, everybody read those dedications and you wanted, it. you wanted everybody to know, hey, this is my man and this is, I love him. And so you had your dedications. Uh, you had people sending in photos of themselves and their children. You had dudes sending in photos from prison, dudes sending in artwork from, from prison. Not just from prison, but you know, other outlets as well, you know, people just sending in artwork and photos. So it was a way for the Chicano community and more the homeboys and homegirl community to communicate with each other. And as I got to know Teen Angel, I realized that he was a Chicano on the hard because uh, being a Chicano isn't uh, something by blood. It's something you feel in your heart, heart you know what I mean? 
it's when you identify with the Chicano culture and you, you, know, you attach yourself to that. That's when you're a Chicano. It doesn't mean you're just a Mexican. Not, not all Mexicans are Chicanos. Not, not all Chicanos are Mexican either. So well, being a Chicano is, is something you feel in your heart. And, and I learned that this old white guy was a Chicano in his heart. About uh, Chicano culture, what uh, what it mean for you in the actual context to, to be a Chicano? Well, with me, uh, I'm, I'm mixed race. So I'm, I'm Mexican, and I'm Hispanic, and I'm white. And uh, so to me, I always kind of had a personal identity crisis because in my heart I felt I identified more with the Mexican culture, but yet when I went to Mexico, they saw me as a white guy because I didn't speak perfect Spanish. And when I was in America, they saw me as a Mexican because they didn't. They saw me, that's the way they viewed me, the way I dressed, the way I looked. So neither culture, you know, was accepting me 100% at that time. So, you know, personally for me, the identity of a Chicano is. Uh, because you're saying, hey, okay, I'm not you know, completely Mexican, I'm not completely American. So, you know, we identify ourselves as Chicanos because this is our own culture. We have a little bit of American influence, we have a little bit of Mexican influence, and we become Chicanos. And, you know, it's just, you know, by the way you grow up, the people you grow up around, around the art, the race, and the culture. So Chicanos are different from Mexicans and Chicanos are different from Americans. They have their own. And about Mexico, does does the zin was distributed there? There was in, not in deep Mexico, but in the border towns like Tijuana, Tigate, and Teen Angel loved Mexico. He loved the style. He loved because he wasn't about Teen Angel was about the neighborhood. And you see a lot of lowriders where guys dump thousands and thousands of dollars into it. And the kind of lowriders teenager liked, and the kind of lowriders he drew, the things that were built at home where guys would hand make parts. And in Tijuana and in Tecate, that happened a lot. You know, people were resourceful. If they wanted fender skirts, they would make their own fender skirts. And so they and they had bought a lot of inexpensive gold time items. So teenager was very uh, into that. Cholo culture from Tijuana and Tecate because he appreciated their style. He always had an appreciation for these people that didn't come from, you know, higher socioeconomic, you know, lifestyle because he had a, a respect for the resource, resourcefulness, a respect for the way they survived on the streets. And, and can we say that uh, Tin Angel is, is a kind of uh, activist? You know, in a way he was through the magazine, because vocally he wasn't, he wasn't about self-gratification. Uh, he didn't need people to know who he was, what he looked like, or what he... Uh, Maybe more like a community organizer. Yeah, than... yeah, but only through the magazines, you know, he would always, he would the teenagers magazines always was letting people know about their rights and making sure they understood their rights. It was very uh, informative and influential in that way. You know? Not just about their rights, you know, as a person, but also uh, educating them on the history of you know, where they came from and where their lifestyle came. And does he write all this history because there was kind of like of Chicano history? Yeah, you know, it was like, you know, Chicano history is, is you know, it's a little bit different than what Teen Angel was doing because he was more focusing on the neighborhoods yeah, and, and some Chicanos even looked down upon yeah. you know, gang bangers and that kind of thing. So Teen Angel, although, you know, he was focused on the Chicano culture, um, a lot of it was, uh, it was more giving the people from the neighborhoods a voice. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah maybe you can, 
did you see, because uh, we know that Teen Angel was very violent and you run a lot of magazines and he lived with the magazine, but did you see him uh, working? How oh, he was working with yeah. all this magazine? <laughs> well, well because he was by the time I, I met Teen Angel um, within the mid 2000s, and when I met Teen Angel, he did Teen Angel's magazine from 1981 up through about 1997. So in the in the 80s and 90s, he had two young sons, David and Johnny, and his wife Lucy. And his two young sons, uh, they tell me stories about how their dad had them, and he was so. When it comes to art, Teen Angel never stopped drawing, he never stopped painting, he never stopped creating. Whatever it was, he was doing something because he was obsessed with it. He was obsessed with art, creating art. And so his son would tell me he was that it's kind of that same way with his children. And it got to the point when when they got you know, of age, uh, they told me that their house was like a little production line. When it was time to do the magazine, when he had it, got everything back from the printer, their mom, David and Johnny would line up on the you know on the table lay things out and he'd have the little boy stapling and they'd be trolling and one would be putting in the boxes. So it was like a, a production, you know, and it was a mom and pop, you know, run magazine, or pop, mostly pop, but the mom had a lot of influence on it, the two boys. And so as they grew, they learned how to put the magazine together. So around 1997 is when Teen Angel decided, when he was done doing Teen Angel's magazine, and he passed it on to his son, Johnny. And Johnny took over the magazine from about 1997 up until uh, probably just two or three years ago. And he had kind of, the magazine had kind of died out for a while. And uh, Johnny allowed uh, Rich Castro, Castro uh, to produce, I think, three magazines. And, and, and that's kind of how it went. And then since then, um, I've taken over the magazine. And I'm kind of taking it in another direction because I'm working on a story about his life. And before uh, Teen Angel died, it was one thing I promised him because as he got sicker, and we were real close, like I said, his only uh, source to the outside world, his only contact was through myself and his wife. And so as he got older, he was like, you know, he kept saying, well, you should do the magazine, I want you to do the magazine. And I said, you know, you've been over 200 magazines, uh, probably close to 300 because there's all these other publications. So, uh, I said, you know, let's tell people the story of your life. I said, people need to know who you are. And I said, you're not just teenager. There's more than teenager. Because the story is amazing. His life story is amazing. And that's what I, I promised him I would continue on with his legacy. And that, and that have the support of uh, his wife, his, his, his first wife, his, uh, the, the mother of his two sons. She passed away in the 90s, and he remarried another woman, named Coco. She's from Mexico, and uh, so I have a good you know, relationship with her and with his two sons. And, and so I'm carrying on his legacy the way him and I had talked about it. And we had planned it out. He was aware of it. Perfect. Thank you so much. On one of the visits, he, I would just go and we would talk all day and, and, and look at books and that kind of thing. And on one visit, he said, you know, I'm getting tired, I need to sleep. And it was rare because usually I'd go in the morning and stay till late at night. It was about 6 o'clock. And he said, I need, I, need, I need some sleep. And I said, okay, man, I'll take off. And he was getting sicker. I said, um, you know, I'll, I'll call you, you know, next week. And he, said, and he said, no, 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 I don't want you to leave. I want you to be here when I wake up. And I said, okay, I'll watch TV. And he goes, no, 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 no. I said, see that door next to the bathroom door? He said, yeah. I said, go inside there. And I had never been in that room. It was a year later. And so I opened the door, and it's like in the movies, you know when you see the light come out? And there was all these boxes of art, and all these creative things he did, boats and ships and buildings. And so I was like, I didn't want to leave that room. I was like, oh no, this is like the Holy Grail, you know? And it hit, you know, over a year he told me he didn't have any art. But he was just... He just wanted, I guess, make sure, you know, people had taken advantage of him over the years. He wanted to make sure that I was, I was different. And, 
and that's how we became, you know, we became good friends. But on that visit, I walked out with this piece of art when he woke up, and I said, "Man, look at," I said, "Dave, you've been holding out on me, man. Look at this." And this is an original drawing, and I said, uh, "You know, I, I said." Up. And he goes, you want that one? I said, yeah. And he goes, well, how much would you give me for it? So we worked out a number, and he was, I said, I can't give you what it's worth, because to me, it's priceless. And so, when I did that, I showed him this, and he signed it on there.